Good evening. Can you hear me? Good. Hi. I'd like to welcome all of you to the New York Society Library. My name is Jeanette Sanger, and I'm, I'm a trustee of this, of this wonderful library, the oldest library in the city, founded the same year as Columbia University in 1754. It served as the first library of Congress. And our charging ledgers reflect the taste of our founding fathers. John Adams, on July 31st, 1789, took out elements of criticism, part one. <laughs> on August 21st, he took out elements of criticism, part two. <laughs> but no return date is listed. So we finally got George Washington to the Mount Vernon estate to return the book he never returned, <laughs> The Law of Nations. And so now my, my quest is to have the Adams family return the elements of criticism to us. <laughs> Our star, and this is all thanks to Jenny Lawrence and Henry Cooper, who wrote a wonderful history of the New York Society Life, where I got my facts. Uh, <laughs> Our star reader was Chief Justice John Jay, taking out 76 volumes, including the Arabian Nights, and he did return them all too. <laughs> Cook's Voyages in two volumes, and Cecilia, a popular novel by Francis Burney. We have a long history of distinguished lecturers, including Ralph Waldo Emerson. I hope you will all contribute generously to the library so we continue to have great lecturers such as Madeline Miller tonight. I first learned about Madeline Miller when she spoke at a symposium in Camden, Maine on ancient Rome about her then new book, The Song of Achilles. I was completely taken, both with the book and with the speaker. We hoped she could come speak here However, she has been busy having two children and writing another book. We are so pleased she is here tonight. Madeline Miller grew up in New York City and Philadelphia. She attended Brown University, where she earned a BA and MA in classics. She went on to teach Latin, Greek, and Shakespeare to high school students. The Song of Achilles, her thrilling first novel, was awarded the 2012 Orange Prize for Fiction and was the New York Times bestseller. Circe, her second novel, which she will be discussing tonight, was an instant number one New York Times bestseller and won the 2018 L Big Book Award. Circe transported me to another world with lavish, lush, palaces and a fierce goddess to a story I already knew, but it was totally reimagined and unexpected. I became mesmerized by the epic family rivalry and romance, a fabulous novel and a scholarly retelling. I never wanted it to end and I've been so looking forward to our speaker tonight. And now let us welcome Madeline Miller. Thank you so, so much. That was so lovely. Um, I, I have to, I'm, I'm a high school teacher, so I, I can't be behind anything. Um, so it is really such, such an honor to be here um, in such a, a haven for books and for book lovers. So thank you all for having me, and thanks to the library for having me. Um, I'm going to start by reading two very short passages from the novel. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about how I came to write the novel and sort of the, the story behind Circe. Um, and then I'm going to throw it open for questions. So Circe in mythology um, is most famous for appearing in Homer's Odyssey, where she turns Odysseus's men into pigs. She is the daughter of the sun god Helios, so she's a goddess. And she is also the first witch in Western literature. And she is born a goddess, but she makes herself a witch. So the first passage I'm going to read comes from after she has just been exiled from her father's halls. She's on the island of Aiaia, which is where she will later on meet Odysseus and his men. And she's just discovering her witchcraft.
Let me say what sorcery is not. It is not divine power which comes with a thought and a blink. It must be made and worked, planned and searched out, dug up, dried, chopped and ground, cooked, spoken over, and sung. Even after all that, it can fail, as gods do not. If my herbs are not fresh enough, if my attention falters, if my will is weak, the drops go stale and rancid in my hands. By rights, I should never have come to witchcraft. Gods hate all toil. It is their nature. The closest we come is weaving or smithing, but these things are skills and there is no drudgery to them, since all the parts that might be unpleasant are taken away with power. The wool is dyed not with stinking bats and stirring spoons, but with a snap. There is no tedious mining. The oars leap willing from the mountain. No fingers are ever chafed. No muscles strained. Witchcraft is nothing but such drudgery. Each herb must be found in its dead, harvested at its time, grubbed up from the dirt, culled and stripped, washed and prepared. It must be handled this way, then that, to find out where its power lies. Day upon patient day, you must throw out your errors and begin again. So why did I not mind? Why did none of us mind? I cannot speak for my brothers and sister, but my answer is easy. For a hundred generations I had walked the world, drowsy and dull, idle and at my ease. I left no prints. I did no deeds. Even those who had loved me a little did not care to stay. Then I learned that I could bend the world to my will, as a bow is bent for an arrow. I would have done that toil a thousand times to keep such power in my hands. I thought, this is how Zeus felt when he first lifted the thunderbolt. The second passage comes from later on in the novel, after she has already started turning men to pigs. <laughs> and the he in this passage is Odysseus. <clears throat> he asked me once, why pigs? We were seated before my hearth in our usual chairs. He liked the one draped in cowhide, with silver inlaid in its carvings. Sometimes he would rub the scrolling absently beneath his thumb. Why not? I said. He gave me a bare smile. I mean it, I would like to know. I knew he meant it. He was not a pious man, but the seeking out of things hidden. This was his highest worship. There were answers in me. I felt them very deep as last year's bulbs growing fat. Their roots tangled with those moments I had spent against the wall, when my lions were gone and my spells shut up inside me. After I changed a crew, I would watch them, scrabbling and crying in the sty, falling over each other, stupid with their horror. They hated it all, their newly voluptuous flesh, their delicate split trotters, their swollen bellies dragging in the earth's muck. It was a humiliation, a debasement. They were sick with longing for their hands, those appendages men used to mitigate the world. Come, I would say to them, it's not that bad. You should appreciate a pig's advantages. Mud slick and swift, they are hard to catch. Low to the ground, they cannot easily be knocked over. They are not like dogs, they do not need your love. They can thrive anywhere, on anything, scraps and trash. They look witless and dull, which lulls their enemies, but they are clever. They will remember your face. They never listened. The truth is, men make terrible pigs. <laughs> relationship to these myths goes back quite a long way into my past, 
And it's wonderful in particular to be speaking here because I grew up right around the corner from here at 78th and Lexington. Um, so it is nice to be back actually in my old stomping grounds. Um, and when I was here growing up, my mother started reading to me little pieces of the Iliad and the Odyssey as bedtime stories, kind of starting when I was five and six, which now she thinks that makes her sound really inappropriate and she's always embarrassed that I tell people. But um, the truth was that I fell in love. And she really knew her daughter. I also liked things like Dr. Seuss and Winnie the Pooh. I also liked those things. But the Greek myths just really grabbed me. And I have a memory of her reciting the first line of the Iliad, which is, sing goddess of the destructive rage of Achilles. And just immediately being drawn into the story. Who is this Achilles? Why is he so angry? Um, I, th I think it felt as if I was touching this other world that was filled with passion and excitement and adult things that I was somehow able to, to be part of. Um, it just felt so large and, and epic, as indeed it is. So um, we used to go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art all the time, and I would see the wonderful collection there, which only fired my imagination. So as soon as I could read for myself, I read all the Greek myths that I could. And then when I came to be... Um, in eighth grade, my school, everyone read the Odyssey in English class. And I was really excited because even though my mom had read pieces and I'd been reading the mythology, I hadn't actually read my own copy of the Odyssey. So I was really excited. I was highlighting like crazy and making notes in the margins. Um, I actually found this copy of the Odyssey the other day and it's incredibly embarrassing to think I was writing in the margins. So no one will ever see that. But. Um, one of the things that I was so excited about was this character of Circe, who I knew was coming in the story. I knew she was a witch, she turned men into pigs, and I was interested in her because she's so powerful, and there are so few female characters like that in Greek mythology. Once you get beyond the big goddesses like Athena and Hera, um, basically most of, the, most of the female characters are just names. They're this person's mother, and this person's daughter, and this person's wife. Um, if their story is really exciting, they might get to die in it. <laughs> but that's sort of it. And there's a lot of you know, characters who um, are very flat or stereotyped. They're sort of the big villains like Medea and Clytemnestra who rain destruction down on people. Um, and Circe is this interesting character who has power, but she's not punished for it by the end of her story. So I was really interested in that. Um, and I was also interested in her because when Odysseus arrives on her island, he arrives on Aiaia at a very sort of tricky moment in his own story. So Odysseus is the prince of Ithaca, and he leaves Ithaca with all the other Greek captains and kings and princes and heads to Troy. And they besiege Troy for 10 years, unable to take the city, until finally Odysseus comes up with the idea of the Trojan horse and the Greek soldiers hide inside the horse, and the Trojans drag the horse into the city, and when the Trojans are asleep, the Greek soldiers come out, they burn the city, they sack the city, they kill the young boys, they take the women as slaves. Sacks of cities in the ancient world were absolutely brutal and horrifying things. They stuff absolutely everything that is movable into their boats, and they sail away. Two years after that, Odysseus is still not home. And in that time, he has lost 11 out of his 12 ships. And he has seen his men torn apart, eaten by cannibals, ships sunk in front of his face, just horror after horror. And so he arrives on Circe's Island with one ship left, and that's it. And they're grieving, they're exhausted, they're demoralized. And then here they are on this beautiful, lush island. They do a little exploring, and they see a little smoke drifting above the trees, and so they realize, well, someone's here, and Odysseus sends a group of his men out to go try and talk to them. Maybe whoever's here can help us, or maybe we can steal from them. One thing, if you have read the Odyssey or you know it, Odysseus is basically a pirate um, in the Odyssey, and he sort of you know, loots his way across the Mediterranean. Um, in fact, that's why he gets into trouble with the Cyclops in the first place, because he, there's a lot of stuff in the Cyclops' cave, and he thinks, well, maybe this person will give me something really good if I just hang out here. Um, turns out not to work out so well for him. So he sends his men to go find out who is this who lives here. And they come to this beautiful palatial home. 
And in the garden of this home, there are tame lions and wolves just sort of hanging out, which they're a little disturbed by, but they continue on to the door. And it's, they're greeted by this beautiful goddess who says, come in, let me give you food, let me give you wine, which she has drugged. And as soon as they consume it, she turns them into pigs and drives them out to her sty. So one of Odysseus's men has hung back. Um, and he has seen all this happen through the window, and he goes running down to tell Odysseus that a witch has turned them all to pigs. So Odysseus now has to go confront the witch and try and get his men turned back. And on his way to confront her, he's stopped by Hermes, who is the great trickster god and the god of travelers, and also an ancestor of Odysseus's. And you can see that they have that kind of sneaky blood. Um, and what Hermes says to Odysseus is she's actually quite a powerful witch, so I'm going to give you an herb that will make you immune to her spells. Odysseus takes it, and thus armed, he goes to confront Circe. And this was the moment that, as a 13-year-old, I was sort of waiting for. Um, because I thought, you know, this is going to be a really interesting scene. There's going to be this battle of wits. There's going to be some good banter. He's smart and complicated. She's smart and complicated. You know, finally we have someone who can really stand up to Odysseus. Um, but what actually happens in the scene is that she gives him the wine, he drinks it, she tries to turn him into a pig, it doesn't work, and then he pulls his sword on her and threatens her. And she screams and falls to her knees and begs for mercy and invites him into her breath, in, in, into her bed, all in one speech. <laughs> and I can still remember the incredibly profound feeling of frustration and disappointment. <laughs> you know, that's it. That's all this exciting female character gets. She has to be, you know, immediately kind of quashed, um, literally put on her knees before the male hero, the phallic sword, did not escape my notice. Um, and, you know, why can't this character be allowed to sort of keep her, keep herself? Um, why does she have to serve the hero's story and be kind of subservient to him? And I, you know, I understood this is Odysseus's story. He's the hero. She's the obstacle. But it just felt like I wanted that camera to stay on her a little bit longer. Um, I wanted to learn why is she turning men into pigs? Homer never tells us. And Odysseus, theoretically the most curious man in literature, does not ask her <laughs> why she's doing it. Um, it's just sort of been assumed over the years that, oh, it's because she's evil. You know, like you do. Um, and she's capricious, she's a woman, who knows why they do anything. Um, but that's a really, you know, for me as a novelist, that's a really uninteresting answer. Because people do things for reasons. Um, even if you don't agree with those reasons, people usually do not act totally without some kind of motivating force. So that immediately drew me into her story, also sort of the mystery about her. Now, as I continue to um, grow up and continue to study these myths, I actually ended up taking Latin. I moved to Philadelphia, I from New York, and I took Latin and I had a wonderful Latin teacher who saw that I was obsessed with these myths and offered to teach me ancient Greek, which I immediately took him up on. <laughs> um, and reading the Homer and the Iliad and the Odyssey in the original Greek was a revelation for me. That I, I thought I had loved it before, but reading it in the original poetry just blew my mind, and I knew that this is what I wanted to study. So I went off to college knowing that I was going to be studying classics, um, and I ended up actually specializing in poetry and epic poetry in particular. And one of the things that kept happening is, of course, I kept coming back to the Odyssey. Um, and I would read it again with different professors, and I would write about it and think about it. So I encountered Circe many more times as an older student. And what I sort of kept thinking about as I encountered her as an older student, is how unfairly she has been treated in kind of popular culture. Um, I think people remember the pigs, understandably, and so they see her as this man-hating villain, the black widow spider at the center of the web, luring men in. Um, I think also sometimes people confuse her with Calypso. Calypso is the other nymph whose name begins with C, so does he sleep with on an island in the Odyssey. So I understand why that happens. But um, Calypso is the one who keeps Odysseus prisoner for seven years against his will. So that's not Circe. She does, she's different. Um, and she actually became sort of this watchword for a frightening woman that in the Renaissance and in, and in medieval books that were about sort of how to control your wife, 
Cersei was the illustration for what happens if you don't control your wife. <laughs> Look what happens when women get power. Men start getting turned into pigs. And she, she's clearly this figure of great anxiety about, about female power. Um, but that is really not the Circe that Homer gives us. So once you get past that moment where she kneels to Odysseus, and they do, in fact, become lovers, she says to him, I see that you and your men are grieving. I see that you are exhausted. Stay on my island and heal as long as you need to. And he takes her up on it. And he and his men stay for a year. She transforms them back into men and actually makes them younger and stronger than they were before as a bonus. Um, and then at the end of that year, Odysseus actually does not want to leave. It is the only place on his journey home that he does not try to leave. His men have to come to him and say, you know, remember Ithaca and Penelope, are we gonna get going at some point? And so Odysseus says, yes, you're right, we have to go. And he goes to Circe and says, okay, I'm ready to leave. And she says, great, here's what you need to know. The first thing is that you have to talk to a dead prophet, so you have to call his spirit out of the underworld. And you know, this is the sort of thing where like, if you're immortal, he's just like, oh my gosh, how am I gonna do this? But she immediately launches into, here's the dimensions of the pit you have to dig, and here are the libations, oh, don't worry, I'll give you the sacrificial animals. This incredibly specific, witchy, supernatural knowledge that you, know, you pretty much have to be Circe to know. And she gives him everything he needs um, so he can do this. And she also gives him really good advice about the monsters he has to pass ahead, Scylla and Charybdis, and also the sirens. The sirens are the beautiful women who sing and their voices enchant you and then you crash your ship onto their rocks because you keep wanting to get closer to them and then they eat you sometimes in some of the stories. Um, and she's the one who says to Odysseus, put beeswax in your men's ears so you can pass by them safely. And then she goes even a step beyond that. She says, but you, Odysseus, if you tie yourself to the mast, you can leave your ears free so you can hear the siren song, but still be safe. Your men will carry you safely past, but you'll be able to hear. And that detail really stuck out to me, because that is exactly the sort of person Odysseus is. Of course he would want to know what the siren song is. Of course he would want to go home and say, I'm the only man alive who has ever heard the siren song. You know, he's going to be dining out on that for the rest of his life. He's the great storyteller. And she gets that about him, and sort of gives him that as a gift. So that was really interesting to me, that in that year that they spent together, it isn't just that they were lovers, they clearly had a really, they, they became friends, she understands him, she has insight into who he is. So that was something that I really wanted to bring back in my portrait of Circe, is how yes, she's frightening and menacing, but she also has this benevolent, wise, healer side that I think has gotten really lost um, in the literary tradition. So that was important. I was also thinking about her witchcraft, which was very interesting to me. I mentioned that she is the first witch in Western literature. Um, and so I did a lot of thinking about witches in literature, and sort of what that meant. And you can see in Circe, in the portrait of Circe, that there are a lot of witchy elements that end up showing up in later versions of witches. Um, you can see she has a staff that she uses, which she sort of brandishes. Scholars argue as to whether or not she's using it to cast the spell, like a wand, or if she just uses it to drive the pigs. Um, I'm actually on the driving the pigs side, but it, she does you know, have it, so it's sort of like a magician's staff or a, or a witch's wand. Um, she also has a knowledge of poisons, herbs, potions, that's what she uses. She uses pharmaca, drugs, in their, in their wine. Um, and she has an association with animals as well, sort of like her lions and wolves, her tame lions and wolves, like a witch's familiars. So you can see, and it's even cats, you know, which is a particular thing. It's big cats, but it's, it's cats. And um, so that was interesting to sort of look at that and then what are the different types of witches that show up in literature, you know, you have the hag type, that's kind of the, what we think of when we say witch, we think of Macbeth and the Weird Sisters, and you know, they're repulsive, and their ingredients are repulsive. Um, and then you have Cersei, who's more kind of like the sexy witch variety. Um, you also have the foreign witch, that's Medea, 
and also Caliban's mother in the Tempest, Sycorax, where you have sort of, she's a witch and she's foreign, and those two things kind of become one frightening thing. It's like, of course she's evil, she's from somewhere else. You know, and it's this, it's this fear of the unknown kind of doubled with them. There is even the good witch category, which J.K. Rowling has brought back. Thank you, Hermione. She's done wonderful things for witches. Um, but one of, the, one of the really interesting things that I found, which has absolutely nothing to do with Cersei or classics, but was really interesting to me as I was looking at witches, is that I discovered this early feminist whose name was Matilda Jocelyn Gage. And she was actually working with um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and a bunch of others in the early uh, feminist movement. And she ended up dropping out because she had a lot of issues with the church, particularly over the historical treatment of witches. Um, and she was one of the women who was saying, you know, I think this whole killing witches thing is not really about the devil. I think this is really about misogyny, which sounds, you know, kind of duh now, but at the time was very shocking. And she actually talked about a lot of these women who were, you know, killed as witches. These were often the village healers. These were women who had knowledge of, you know, herbs. Maybe they could, they could, they were doctors, and then things would go bad, and they would be killed. And so she talked about them as kind of early scientists, and said that they should be honored for that. So aside from the fact that she is very interesting in her own right, I then realized that she has an interesting son-in-law, because she is the mother-in-law of L. Frank Baum, and he wrote Glinda in honor of her is the ultimate, you know, good witch example of how, yes, there are good witches out there. So that's one of my favorite things I found. <laughs> so I would like to share. Um, and she's a very interesting figure, so uh, I recommend checking her out. Um, but, but looking at, at all, that, all that witchcraft stuff, I think what I, what I really found about that goes back to that fear, which is that what witches are in literature is they are women who have more power than the people around them think they should have. They have an amount of power that feels societally abnormal. And usually that's frightening for the men around them in particular, but just in general. And so I wanted Cersei to have that sort of outsider status. And that made sense also with Homer, because I always start with Homer when, I, when I'm thinking about these characters. Um, and Homer had a couple really interesting details that he gave about Cersei, and one of them is that he calls her the dread goddess who speaks like a human. And he just drops that in. That word speaks like a human is just one word in Greek, audeasa. Um, and what, is that, what does that mean, to be a goddess who speaks like a human? And from a novelist's perspective, I immediately thought, this is a character who has a foot in two worlds. She's born a goddess, but there's some piece of her that is reaching for or drawn to the world of mortals. Um, so she is a little bit of an outsider in both worlds. She's not human, but she's also not really fully God, because she has this thing about her that is, that is human, um, or, or an ability that is very human. And so that was something that really animated my imagination. For those of you who read the book, you'll see that that formed a huge part of my <laughs> thinking about Cersei. Um, and then the, the other really interesting detail that we hear um, about her and Homer is, is that she has this, um, this brother whose mind is bent on destruction. That's also one word in the Greek. The Greeks have great adjectives. Um, so, you know, whose mind is bent on destruction. And this brother's name is Aetes. He's the father of Medea. So Medea is actually her niece. And one of the things about Circe that was so interesting is I had been used to thinking about Circe exclusively as it relates to Odysseus. But what I really wanted to do is open up her story. Where are, her, where are the other references to her? And it turns out she has this whole mythological history that has absolutely nothing to do with Odysseus. She's the aunt of Medea. She's also the aunt of the Minotaur, actually. Her sister is also a witch. Um, and her sister becomes the mother of the Minotaur. I cannot believe there's not already an HBO miniseries about her sister, Pasiphae. <laughs> she's a very, I mean, you have to imagine, she'd be a very intense person. Um, and so, so that was interesting to me. She also is related to all these titans, because as the daughter of the sun god, so she is related to Prometheus um, and a bunch of other 
divinities as well. So that was really interesting to me. So I wanted to look at her whole life. I wanted this novel to really be about what is, what is her life like. And just as she is a cameo in Odysseus's story, I wanted to flip that and make him just a cameo in her story. Um, and I was actually very deliberate about that. She is in two plus books of the Odyssey, and so he is in two plus chapters of the novel. <laughs> Cut him off after that. <laughs> um, because because I, I really wanted this to be her story, and, and that was how I imagined this, is, is she finally gets to tell her story. And that, you know, the Odyssey, that's the male heroic tradition, but what would it look like through her eyes? And I think Circe is a particularly bright character to do that with, although there are so many characters in, in ancient literature um, that, are, that are wonderful for that Penelope, I mean, just in the Odyssey alone, Calypso herself. Um, but Circe's episode in the Odyssey is actually narrated by Odysseus. It's one of the parts where Odysseus is telling the story. And when you realize that, you realize, wow, this is an incredibly self-serving narrative that Odysseus is telling. <laughs> You know, I met this powerful witch, but I overcame her, and then she threw herself at me. And she's gorgeous and sexy, and I stayed on her island, and she did everything for me. And, you know, all this sort of story about that's meant to burnish his own legend. And, you know, everything about her, how he describes her as so beautiful, that really is meant to reflect positively on him. Um, and so one of the things I wanted to do as I was thinking about that is, okay, that's Odysseus's voice talking. Now, how would some of those things look? from Circe's perspective, if we flip that around and sort of stripped away Odysseus's self-aggrandizing. Um, and so, so that, was, that was sort of the final piece that I was thinking about. Uh, there's a lot more I could say <laughs> about mythology, the sources I used, um, the Odyssey, but I want to pause, because I want to make sure I'm talking about what people want to hear about. So are there any questions? Yes. I know your lecturing journey has intersected at many points with Emily Wilson's yes. um, translator of the Odyssey. Is Emily Wilson's Odysseus an Odysseus that you recognized, or did he feel different from your concept of Odysseus? Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, I thank you for bringing up Emily Wilson. I take every opportunity to say that her Odyssey is fabulous. Um, she's a brilliant scholar, and I think what she gets about translating the Odyssey is, you know, people used to read these things for fun. Um, and so she really captures the fact that not only is she just an incredibly precise and thoughtful scholar, but she makes it fun to read. You know, it's punchy, it's exciting. Um, I think one thing that happens when you translate from the ancient Greek is that there's this sort of bloat that happens where like one line of ancient Greek can easily become three lines in English, but she limits herself to the same number of lines in English as in Greek. So it really moves like Homer, um, which is really great. So she's fabulous. Uh, her Odysseus is very, I think, I think she was very alert to some of the more negative aspects of Odysseus's character, um, as she should be. One of the things that I think is true about Odysseus is that we have come to really love Odysseus. He's kind of our favorite modern hero. Um, the Odyssey was recently voted the best story in England. Um, they had like this huge BBC poll, and Odysseus and the Odyssey were voted, you know, the best. Um, <laughs> which is really, would have really puzzled the agents, because they thought he was pretty awful. Uh, and there are all these negative stories. The Odyssey is basically the most positive story about him out there. Um, and in the Iliad, you see he, at one point, goes on a night raid, finds a bunch of sleeping Trojan allies, thinks, great, they're asleep, they're not armed, let's just kill them right now. Um, and he does. And that's how you win wars. But Achilles and Ajax, that's not something they would ever do. So he, he is a real pragmatist, but he is not really a man of honor. And so the, the ancients saw him as, as a real liar and sort of a, a sneak um, and not a great person. So uh, I think she brings in some elements of that. You know, she kind of strips away a little bit of that legend of him as our favorite lovable hero. You know, he's the brains over brawn. I think we like that. He also, he does have a great wife. I think we like that too. <laughs> and you know, their story is one of the very few kind of relationships you can look to in the ancient mythology and think, well, that's, you know, they're equals. These are, these are two people that, that belong together. <laughs> um, and, his, he, and he is very legitimately loyal to her, aside from the fact that he sleeps with a bunch of people. But he, he does turn down immortality. Calypso offers him immortality, and he turns it down. And, and he says, I would rather go home and be with Penelope. 
So, you know, he, he legitimately makes some choices to, to be with her. Um, but I, I liked that aspect, and I tried to bring out those parts of the Odyssey, but also bring in other versions of Odysseus. Um, a couple people have asked me, why do you hate Odysseus so much in your, in your book? Um, I do not hate Odysseus at all. I think he's really interesting, but I, I, think, he's very, I think he's a very ambiguous figure. Um, and when we talk about heroes today, we really mean something different than what the ancient Greeks meant. You know, when we talk about heroes, we talk about people who are moral exemplars. Whereas the ancient Greeks, when they were talking about heroes, they were talking about people with huge strengths and also huge flaws. And Achilles and Odysseus make terrible mistakes in their respective epics. They rain destruction down on the people around them. Um, they're, you know, they're angry, they're proud, they're constantly, you know, flying off the handle. Um, they make mistakes like trying to raid Cyclops' with cave. So I, I wanted that complexity that's in the ancient literature to be there in, in my depiction of him. So I think, I think she and I are, are on the very same page about Odysseus. <laughs> Yes. Um, speaking of translation, uh, which translation of the Iliad would you recommend? Mm, people always ask me this, and I don't have a good answer um, because I think I think there are, there's no one edition that really jumps out to me the same way Emily Wilson does. She is now working on the Iliad, so in six years, ask me again. Um, that's what she said. She said for six, it's going to take me six years. So, um, but what I do recommend with the Iliad is to listen to the audio book for two reasons. One is this is how these works were originally presented. They were originally performed. They were composed and performed and you know there were bards singing them and, and they came out of oral tradition. So you know I think that mimics the way more that the ancients would have experienced them. But also there are a lot of names in the Iliad. <laughs> There's like book two has a whole catalog of ships where they list all the ships that came to Troy and all the people who were in charge of those ships. There are also sort of long battlefield scenes where it's like, and then this guy died, and then this guy died, and then this guy died. And I think if it's your first time with the Iliad, it tends to be you sort of like, well, who's important? Should I be highlighting this name? Is, is, does this matter? And I think the audiobook version lets those names go by the way they're sort of supposed to go by, um, as opposed to getting bogged down in this list of names on the page. So, the audio book. I think there's a Derek Jacobi version. Yes? Hi, since you mentioned audio books, I actually read Cersei on audio. And I loved the narrator, and I actually have read a quote from you, just because I know there's been a lot of great response about the audio book, that you sort of had some samples, and you picked who you liked best, but you never actually heard her perform your work before you chose her. And I was just wondering if that's something you think about when you write, is how it will sound when read aloud, because mm -hmm. I just, there were parts of it that just, they, it sounded so beautiful, and obviously the words are beautiful, and the story was wonderful, but it was just, it was a perfect book to read on audio, so I was just wondering if that was purposeful. Well, thank you so much. Um, it was. <laughs> um, because these do come out of um, oral tradition and out of that, poetry of performance, you know, they were originally songs in, in the original. Um, that's what the Iliad means. The ad in Iliad is where we get the English word ode. It's the song of Troy. And so I, I really was very aware that I wanted it to sound okay out loud. <laughs> um, and so I, I often would read parts out loud to make sure that there was nothing kind of scraping in my ear. Um, as I was doing that and, and that it, it flowed. I spend a lot of time on the character's voice anyway, even without thinking about sort of reading out loud, that, that getting inside the character's head and, and really hearing her voice um, is just so important to me. I don't ever want to be reaching for a word. I want it to flow. So there's this long period of time where I'm writing and throwing out, writing and throwing out, writing and throwing out, getting out all the bad versions of her voice. And then hopefully I, you know, once I get the, the actual one in my head, then I, can, then I can go. But I was very aware of that. Um, and I feel very fortunate that I have a theater background because that really helped with listening to the samples. <laughs> um, I listened to, I probably listened to a hundred samples of different voices, different readers. 
Um, and, and as you said, it, it was difficult because you can't hear them reading your stuff. You're hearing them read, you know, a thriller or a mystery novel or a nonfiction book. Um, and so trying to kind of cast them. So I was glad I had some theater training. I think that was very helpful to that. <laughs> Why didn't you read it yourself? You read so well. Oh, thank you. Um, they didn't ask me. My <laughs> That's really why. I would have said yes. Sure. Um, so there were four main stories about her. One is the Odyssey. Um, one is from Ovid. And Ovid loves Circe because she's a goddess of transformation. And his major work is the Metamorphoses, the transformation. So of course Circe has to make an appearance. And the story he tells about her um, is, is a very different Circe than we see in the Odyssey. She's much more pathetic and lovelorn. She's kind of always falling in love with the wrong guy, and then he's not into her, and then she gets angry, and she lashes out. It's sort of that story. Um, and she falls in love with a god who used to be immortal, whose name is Glaucus. Um, but Glaucus does not love her back. He loves a nymph whose name I'm not going to say, because it's a big spoiler. It is a 3,000-year-old story, but um, I'm not going to say it. And she does something horrible to that nymph. And I ended up pushing back against Ovid a little bit. I kept that love triangle. I kept the horrible thing she did to the nymph. Um, but I wanted to give her a lot more of a psychological reason for doing what she does. You know, Ovid is really not interested in her psychology. He's interested in her power. And so he really enjoys sort of the parts where she's like cooking up the potion and casting the spell. And that's what he, that's what he likes. Um, but I, I was interested in her psychology, so that's always what I was, I was looking at. And then the other thing I really wanted is I wanted to make her live with that horrible thing that she's done, um, you know, for the rest of her eternity. <laughs> so that was another one. Um, the third one was Apollonius of Rhodes' Argonautica, which is about Jason and the Argonauts getting the Golden Fleece, coming back with Medea, and Medea and Jason kill Medea's brother and slice him up and throw the bits over the side to slow her father down who's chasing them. They figure her father will have to stop and pick up the bits, which he does. <laughs> but now they've done something really horrible and they have miasma on them, they have pollution. So they stop off at Circe's Island um, in the Argonautica to get purified from this horrifying deed that they have done. Um, and in it, Medea sort of hides who she is. She doesn't acknowledge, she doesn't tell Circe until Circe has purified them. So I kept that. I knew, oh my gosh, the two great witches of ancient literature who are on in these, of course I need to have this scene. Um, but their whole conversation that they have was all made up by me, um, but based on the story from the Argonautica. Uh, and then the fourth, the last one, um, is actually an ancient epic that we don't have. We only have it in summary. So the Iliad and the Odyssey were the most famous of the ancient epics, and they're the, the ones that have survived, but there were several others um, that told different versions of, um, or different parts of, of the Troy story, or different parts of, there's one called the Returns, which is all about all the Greeks coming home from the Trojan War, except for Odysseus, who gets his own offshoot. Um, and one of these was called the Telegony. And in the Telegony, Circe is pregnant with a son by Odysseus when he sails away. She raises her son as a single mother on the magical island of Aiaia, and when he comes of age, he wants to go looking for his father. So he goes, he encounters Odysseus, some stuff happens, and skip over it. Um, and eventually, one of, what ends up happening is that he brings Penelope, Odysseus' wife, and Telemachus, Odysseus' son with Penelope, back to the island of Aiaia, and all four of them are on the island of Aiaia. And I knew I wanted that story as well, because Penelope, again, one of these amazing figures from mythology, and I think she and Circe have a lot in common by that point. They've both lived through a lot, <laughs> um, and they've managed to sort of hold on to who they are through a lot of hostility around them. Um, and so, you know, having a scene, knowing that that scene where Cersei and Penelope meet was waiting for me at the end of the novel was really exciting. <laughs>
So those were the four, those were the four. I did not, there was one myth I didn't use from Ovid where she turns this guy into a woodpecker. It just didn't speak to me. <laughs> I let it go. <laughs> Said Cersei was the first witch mentioned in Western literature. What about Hecate? Yes, so she is, she was kind of retrofitted to Cersei's story. Um, in later versions of the myth, she's sometimes Cersei's mother, sometimes her sister, um, sometimes she's Medea's mother. <laughs> so she kind of gets fitted in there. She's not really a Homeric figure. Um, she really kind of came in, came in more, much more later. Uh, she is sometimes seen as kind of the witch version of Artemis. Sometimes she's just her own figure. Um, but she doesn't really appear as a character, and the Odyssey and the Iliad are the oldest works we have. So um, she is definitely a witch, <laughs> um, and definitely present, and, and later on, she would often be invoked in, you know, cursed tablets and in spells that people were casting when you get sort of out of the post-Homeric time. Yeah, sure. There's a lot of confusion about who she is and who exactly she's related to. <laughs> so, yes? Um, two things. One, I just wanted to say that before I read this book, I was not into Greek mythology at all. <laughs> my daughter told me, oh, you love this book. And I said, yeah, I'm not into Greek mythology. I'll put it on the end of my long list. And then I read it, and I'm totally in love with it. So <laughs> thank, thank you. you for telling me about Greek mythology. My question is, one of the relationships I was most uh, attracted to in the book was her relationship with her father, Helios. So I wanted to hear you riff a little bit like you did with the last question, or two questions ago about how much of that is actually from Homer, and how much of it did you put your own stuff in? Mm -hmm. um, there is n the only thing that Homer tells us about Circe and Helios. He says that Circe is Helios' daughter, and that he carried her on his chariot to the island of Aiaia, and that's it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Helios and, and the gods, it, it was something I, I was really interested in grappling with. Um, and it really, in some ways, came out of Song of Achilles. In Song of Achilles, Achilles' mother is a nymph. She's a goddess. Um, but even though she's a goddess, she's like the lowest of the low. That's what nymphs were in the Greek hierarchy. You know, that Helios and Zeus, they were up here. And then there are all these other levels of like the winds and the graces and the river gods. And down at the very, very bottom, that's where the nymphs are. Um, and they have really almost no power at all. And in mythology, particularly in Ovid, we've been talking a lot about Ovid, they are, they are prey. They're the ones who are being assaulted, they're being traded and used sort of as bargaining pieces. Um, and it's really, they, they have very little agency over their lives. And so I was interested in this tension of what it is to be born a goddess, but to be born a goddess with absolutely no power and no ability to control your life. Um, and the Greek gods were pretty horrendous in all the stories. I mean, you know, the, the classic story about the gods is you have Artemis, who's bathing in a moonlit pool, naked. A hunter comes by, he accidentally sees her naked. That's forbidden. It doesn't matter that he's sorry. You know, it doesn't matter that he didn't mean to. She turns him into a deer and has him torn apart by his own dogs. So that's sort of the level of like empathy and mercy <laughs> <laughs> that exists among the Greek gods. Um, and you know, today we would call the gods sociopathic narcissists. But they are completely obsessed with what they want. They will pursue it to the end of time. You know, if you run afoul of a god, not only are they going to punish you, but they're going to punish your children and your children's children. They're going to hold that grudge um, until you know someone, something huge happens that that reverses it. Um, and so, I was interested in in the cruelty of the gods I and mean, just how, you know, what happens when you have so much power and are so insulated from any harm because you're immortal that you sort of forget what it's like to feel, really, any sort of pity or empathy. Um, and yet then you have this figure of Circe, who is a nymph, a little bit closer to humanity. There's this interesting thing from Homer, she speaks like a mortal. And then there's this interesting bit in Ovid where Ovid describes her as um, having an ingenium, which is an in, like a temperament, an inborn quality. 
uh, more suited for love. And he means romantic love, but I thought of it more like empathy. And so I felt like there was a conflict there right from the beginning, that she feels something that her, her family doesn't. Um, and you know, one of the things I, I love about these stories is that when you strip away the gods and the monsters, these are incredibly human stories. That the Odyssey is really this exhausted war veteran who's desperate to get home to his family and then struggles to enter his old life and sort of you know, be himself again. Can you go back home after being away for 20 years? What does that look like? Um, can you go back home to rocks and goats when you've been best of the Greeks and after all the violence you've seen and after all the pain you've suffered? And with Circe, I, I wanted to, to really have that same feeling that, you know, yes, there are gods and monsters, but this is also the story of a person born into an absolutely horrific family who is trying to get out. And can she get out? And, you know, what does it mean? What does it cost to get out? Yes? I was struck by your description of your mother reading these stories to you when you were so very young. <laughs> I just can't imagine having done that with my children. But that's probably my issue. Um, and I wonder, of your students, you said you're a high school student, how many come with some basic knowledge of these stories? And is there a big discrepancy that some are familiar with them, some have no idea, and how do you deal with that in the classroom? Mm. Um, so first of all, I will say I don't think it's just you, because now my daughter is four, and we've been looking at the Dolaire's Book of Greek Myths, mm -hmm. and we just looked at the Icarus and Daedalus picture, where Icarus is like tumbling into the ocean, and my four-year-old's like, Mommy, what happens to him? And I was like, he's fine, his dad goes and gets him, and they go home. So I totally chickened out. <laughs> Tell the truth about that, but <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, my students, it, it depends. In my Latin classes, students usually come with some kind of background. They're they're there because they've read Percy Jackson and they love Percy Jackson. They're there because they saw the movie Troy and they thought it looked really cool, um, or because they have some kind of middle school background in in mythology and they're interested in in taking Latin. Um, when I taught world history. Oftentimes, they had no background at all. Um, so the, I think some students are self-selecting into Latin. <laughs> uh, so, but now Percy Jackson, you know, more and more, I think students have at least heard of it. Maybe they've seen the movie, they've read one of the books, and so there's a little bit more, I feel like there's a, kind of a resurgence that's happening, actually. Yes? On the last question, I'm really interested in the psychology that you employ in the novel, and when I was finished reading, I was wondering, do you have any formal training in psychology? Because your characters are so well informed, it's almost hard not to wonder where you get that from. It's amazing. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, and you know that that is what has always drawn me to the works is that Homer really does not give us psychology. Um, he gives us, I think, he implies psychology, um, but he he gives us characters taking action, but he doesn't really give us kind of you know the Hamlet soliloquy. Um, version. He doesn't give us what Shakespeare gives us, and so part of what I really always want to be doing is kind of creating that psychology and why are they doing this, and what is it? What does it feel like to be inside their head at that moment when they make that choice? Um, I, the college that I went to does not have minors, but if they did, I would have had a minor in psychology. <laughs> so I did actually take a bunch of psychology classes because I love psychology um, and I find it really interesting. But I think honestly, the, the thing that helped me most with that was theater. Um, I direct Shakespeare plays, and when you're directing a play, every character needs to have an arc, and they need to sort of have their own thing that's going on. Um, even if they're a very small character, you know, they, they can't just, you can't tell an actor to just, just stand there. I mean, that's, you know, as an audience member, if you're looking at that, you're like, that person is just standing there. <laughs> you know, immediately. Um, so you want that actor to have, you know, an idea about the character, and most importantly, you want them to change. You know, if they're, if they're I, I often use Lear as the example, if you're one of Lear's knights in the beginning of the play, you feel very differently um, then than how you feel at the end of the play when Lear is dead. You know, that you have to go on some kind of journey there, even if you have two lines. You know, your emotional character has to go on that journey. And so I'm always thinking about that. You know, what is the arc? 
what are these characters doing? Um, and I think working with actors on answering that question helps me to think about my characters that way. Maybe one more question? Sure. Yes. Um, her relationship with her feelings about Prometheus. Sure. So um, I mentioned that she is related to Prometheus, and she uh, there is no myth about her talking to Prometheus. This happens earlier in the novel, so it's not really a spoiler. Um, she has a conversation with with Prometheus, and one of the things I wanted to be really aware of is not making Circe like the Forrest Gump, like and then she saw Hercules, and then she saw you know Theseus, and then like sort of the whole through. So I tried to only find moments where she interacted with major myths where it really made sense. And Prometheus was, was a place where I thought it really made sense um, for two reasons. One, because her father, Helios, and her grandfather, Oceanus, are a huge part of the Prometheus myth in the ancient literature. And so it made sense, given that her father and grandfather are so much a part of it, for her to have some role in it. Um, but the other thing is that he is one of the few exceptions to God's who are cruel, that he is, you know, he's the one who looks down at humans and sees them suffering and says, I'm going to bring them fire, um, I'm going to bring them in some story civilization as well, I'm going to help them. And then he is brutally punished for that. Um, but, and he, he's also a god of prophecy, so he knows, likely, that he's going to be punished for it, and he does it anyway. Um, and so I, I thought that, you know, here she is, this character who this person who's been born into this family where she doesn't really have any models for any kind of behavior other than purely selfish, and then here is this figure who um, has done something completely unselfish, and I thought she would be very interested in that and drawn to it. Thank you all so much for coming.